Well, uh, hello and welcome. It's good to know that uh, service has been resumed, really. Uh, we had quite a, uh, a wonderful hiatus uh, for much of November uh, when we were in uh, Indonesia and uh, Jakarta specifically for our conference, um, which was certainly a, a, a very exciting uh, experience for all of those of us who had the good fortune to be there. Uh, but yes, it kind of having been on that high, it's taken us a while just to kind of get back onto the saddle and to be back. But it's good to be now uh, sharing stories and for us actually just to be um, able to sit back and listen uh, as you tell stories this evening. Uh, and we have uh, six, possibly seven stories. We'll see how we go during the evening, uh, all together on the theme of myths and legends. Uh, and I can assure you that I think there are going to be some tonight that you may never have come across before, because even Sheila, who tends to know everything about all sorts of stories, has just admitted that she hasn't heard uh, at least one of the stories that's going to be told this evening. So let's get the ball rolling. Shilpa, it's great to have you um, with us and to share another story. How are things with you? Hello, Roger, and hello, everyone. Everything is fine here. Uh, have you managed to avoid the floods? We've been hearing terrible uh, stories of the floods in many parts of India. Yeah, but that's in south of India, and I am here in the west of India. But yes, oh. now things are under control. Things are better. Good. Well, I'm glad you, that you're dry, and we're looking forward to your story. So uh, over to you. Well, I am the first one to begin this session, and that's what my story is. Well, according to Hindu mythology, whenever we begin any auspicious occasion or any good thing, we always pray to Lord Ganesha. So today I'm the first one and I'm going to tell you the legend behind it. So the legend goes something like this. When both Ganesha and his brother Kartike were very young, one day, they both were playing and while playing, they come across a fruit and both of them grabbed it and well, the way siblings are, they didn't want to share it and they started fighting over that fruit. Then they decided that they are going to take this fruit to their father, Lord Shiva, and let him decide who is going to take that fruit. Both the kids they go to their father, Lord Shiva. Daddy, who's going to take this fruit? Oh, and the moment Shiva sees that fruit, he sees that it is not some ordinary fruit. Whoever eats that fruit would gain immorality, immorality and supreme wisdom and knowledge. So now to see who is the right bearer or who deserves this fruit, Lord Shiva decides to test both the kids and he gives them a task. He asks both of them to go around the world three times and whoever comes first would get the fruit. So, Kartikeya, he immediately hops onto his vehicle Peacock. Yes, peacock. Well, gods and goddesses in Hindu mythology have uh, some other, other animal as their vehicle. So Kartikeya's vehicle was the peacock. And he thinks, oh, well, my peacock, it can fly fast. And I am going to win this race. And my brother Ganesha, oh, look at his body. He's so stout. And what is his vehicle? A mouse. Oh, he can never win. So Kartikeya, he immediately moves and he covers all the rivers and the oceans and the hills and the mountains and the galaxies and this and that. And he covers everything. Now, here, Ganesha was sitting next to his parents. After some time, he gets up and starts 
taking circles around his parents, Lord Shiva and Parvati. One round. Second round. And the third round. And he sits down near their feet. Lord Shiva is perplexed and he asks him, Ganesha, what are you doing? And Ganesha says, Well, my parents mean the world to me. They are the world to me. So, this going around them three times means that I have covered the whole world. Well, Lord Ganesha was impressed by Ganesha's, sorry, Lord Shiva was impressed by Ganesha's knowledge and wisdom. And he thinks that Ganesha truly deserves that fruit. And now, when Kartike comes back after completing three rounds of the world, he sees that Ganesha is sitting on Lord Shiva's lap and he is having that fruit. He gets very angry and furious and he says, Oh, how come you came so fast? You must have cheated. I know, you must have cheated. Otherwise, it was not possible. It's just not possible to cover three rounds of the world. That too on that mouse of yours. Then Lord Shiva tells the whole story to Kartike and says that it is Ganesha who deserves this fruit. And it is at that moment Lord Shiva announces that from now on, before the beginning of any good thing or any auspicious occasion, Ganesha would be prayed first. So that's why, according to Hindu mythology, we pray to Lord Ganesha before anything, whether it's any housewarming pot party or any auspicious occasion, even before we give our exams. And as far as the weddings are concerned, the first invitation card is offered to none other than Lord Ganesha. And that's the legend why Hindus always pray to Lord Ganesha before beginning anything in their life. Thank you. Well, thank you so much for that, Shilpa. How appropriate, as you say, that we uh, chose you to start the whole session. That must have been... I wonder, some divine intervention there, I think. Yeah. Thank you. I knew the story, but I'm, I'm so glad that you contextualized that for us. I didn't realize the importance of that story. But it's one that I, you know, I've, I've told to my son a couple of times. It hasn't had any effect on him whatsoever. But thank you very much indeed for sharing that story. So we're going to move on now to uh, Christine. Hi, Christine. It is good to have you back with us again. Thank you, Roger. Um, and you have recovered from uh, Jakarta? Well, somewhat. <laughs> we've, we've had some very hot weather here, too. So it kind of alternates back and forth between being very hot and unpleasant mm. and then quite pleasant. Uh, so for people who don't know where I am, I'm in Sydney, Australia. And... Um, it was lovely to be with uh, other feast storytellers in Jakarta. So uh, we're delighted. Uh, all our members from our Storytelling Guild, which is a institutional member of Feast, uh, embrace a whole lot of different stories. So we always welcome an opportunity to share different stories. Well, I think you were teasing me there because uh, we are actually in the midst of discussions about having a story swap with uh, members from the NSW, the Guild, uh, which I hope we'll be able to con confirm very soon in the new year. So that'll be uh, yes. a different kind of story swap, a collaboration between uh, NSW and Feast. So with yes. that uh, good news to tease uh, everybody this evening, why don't you share uh, your story for us, Christine? Okay, thank you. Well, in the shadow of the rugged cliffs, where waves embrace the land, there unfolded a tale as old as the rolling hills. A Welsh myth, 
a Welsh tale carried on the winds of Cardigan Bay. It was a long, long time ago. There were three beautiful sisters and their names were Branwen, Gwensian and Olwen. And they lived with their father in a big mansion above the beach in a rocky outcrop. And every day the three girls would walk down the track, down onto the beach and they'd skip along the sands and they'd laugh and they'd play and the wind would rush up against their cheeks and lift their hair. And then they would stop and they would listen to the whisper of the waves on the wind. And this is what it said. Branwen, Gwenchian and Olwen, the prettiest girls in the world. The prettiest girls in the world. And indeed they were. Their beauty was astounding. People were amazed at their big, wide eyes, their silken skin, and their golden hair that cascaded over their shoulders. And as the girls' laughter would ripple on the wind, the story of their beauty rippled on the waves throughout the world. And then it travelled down through the waves to the depths of the ocean where the mermaids lived and where also lived Dylan, the king of the sea, where he lived in his crystal and coral castle. Well, when he heard of this beauty, he decided that he had to go and see for himself. So he swam through the waves and peeked his head above and was astounded at what he saw. Their beauty captured him so much that he said, I have to have them come and live with me. So the very next night, he called up a terrifying storm. In the darkness of night, the waves whipped along the beach. They washed over all the fishermen's boats in the harbour. They crashed up against the rocks and foam flew into the air. The girls were inside their mansion, frightened by the noise, the sound, the darkness. And then Branwen thought that she heard someone calling outside. So she went to the door and she opened the door. And as soon as she did, it was as if something pulled her out. The door slammed and she disappeared into the night. Well, Gwenshian wondered where... Branwen was because she hadn't come back, so she too went to the door. And when she opened the door, the same thing happened. It was like she was pulled out and she disappeared into the darkness of the night. Well, Olwen was the only one left and she was worried that neither of her sisters had returned, so she made her way to the door and she listened. And outside, she could hear the fury of the waves crashing, the wind hurling and swirling. Would she open the door? Should she open the door? She did. Once she opened the door, the waves gathered around her feet, cold and icy, and foam blew up into her face, and then she felt a hand a cold, wet hand come onto her shoulder. It was the hand of Dylan, the king of the sea, and he pulled her out of that house and she too disappeared into the darkness of the night. Well, in the morning, the storm had calmed and no one knows how it was that the father managed to sleep through that storm. But when he got up and found that his three daughters were not there, he sent one of his workers down to the village to see where they had gone. And that worker returned breathless and distressed with news that he'd spoken to one of the fishermen who was out trying to secure his boats and he had said that he had seen long golden hair floating in the water. The father was heartbroken because he knew that 
his three daughters had golden hair. Well, Dylan himself, the king of the sea, was was he was delighted that he had achieved his goal of capturing the three sisters. But he could see that although he was happy, they were not. And they were experiencing what is called hirith, which is a deep sadness, a deep longing, a longing for their father, a longing for their beach, a longing for a life on the land. And he didn't want to see them saddened. So he thought, I've got to think of something that will ease their pain. So he came up with an idea. He decided to change those three sisters into three beautiful white seagulls so that during the day they could fly to the land and be with their father and that at evening time they could fly back and enter down into the ocean, into the depths of the sea and live with him in that crystal and coral castle. And so that's what happened. And each day those three pure white seagulls would fly to the beach where they would see their father walking in deep sadness. And it was a while before he realised that those three gulls that came every day were his daughters. But he was still heartbroken. And the three girls, well, they were still experiencing hirith, that deep, deep longing. And even today, if you listen to the call of the seagulls, ah, 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 it's a call of sadness. It's a call of longing. It's a call that is in unison with those three girls, Branwen, Gwenshian, and Olwen, the prettiest girls in the world. Thank you. Oh, I love that. Uh, I'm a Jenkins, of course. I'm a Welshman, or at least my parents yes. were anyway. Uh, and my favourite auntie was Olwyn. Ah. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, and of course, my son's Dylan. So. <laughs> oh, well, there we are. <laughs> is he the king of the sea? That's the question. <laughs> well. <laughs> and is he stealing maidens? <laughs> well, yes. No, he's he, he, he has one. Fortunately, he's not chasing after three he, he's got his his one so so that seems to be uh he's very happy with that so yes thank you very much for that story i didn't know it um right but, um, yes well uh, a welsh tale from cardigan bay mm. yeah which is uh, on the west coast of wales that's absolutely i was just about to say that the west coast of wales is uh, quite splendid uh and you go a bit further around to um uh, pembrokeshire uh, which is really kind of southwest, and it's just magnificent. So if anybody who likes uh, cliffs and uh, uh, sea and uh, wild beaches and so on, then I can certainly recommend uh, the, the Welsh coastline for sure. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Christine, for sharing thank that. Uh, and now uh, it's a great pleasure to welcome uh, Zara from uh, Jogjakarta. Uh, hi, good to, to, to see you. Um, I had the immense pleasure and privilege of telling stories in the um, uh, Hutang Pinas, which Hutan is Pinas, the, yeah. Yeah, right, the pine <laughs> forest just outside the city. I have been to Georgia so many times and never knew it was there. Um, and a quite spectacular setting in which to tell uh, stories along with uh, uh, Ala Lebedeva from Moscow and Priyanka Chatterjee from um, Kolkata, as well as uh, the... Uh, local Indonesian tellers. It was a wonderful session. Uh, and I envy you having that as a kind of a performance space. And I want to say thank you so much for uh, joining us uh, this evening and to uh, make your debut here on Feast. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So this is good. So are you going to be you're telling an Indonesian? Uh, it will be in English. In, but it's, a, it's an Indonesian legend? Yeah, it's an Indonesian legend. Wonderful. Okay. So yeah, over to you, Zara. Okay, thank you for your card, Roger, because from that card, I know this event. <laughs> Hi, everyone. I'm Zahra. Uh, I met Roger in Yogyakarta 
that's where I come from. And actually, this would be my very first time to tell you a story, to tell audience's story. So wish me a good luck. Good luck. <laughs> okay, so this story is Timun Mas. This is the original story or legend from Java, Indonesia. This story begins with the wish of an old lady. Oh, if only I have someone beside me, my life would be brighter and full of joy. The old lady, Mbok Rondo, lived far away in the jungle. She had to walk quite far to meet more people in the village, and her husband had passed away 10 years ago. That is why she was very lonely. One day, Mbok went to the river to do the laundry. While she was washing the clothes with her own hands, she kept murmuring, Oh, what a lonely life. I need a companion. And if it is a child, I think it would be perfect, she said. Ho, 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 ho. I heard someone making a wish. Suddenly, a giant with green skin appeared behind the trees. Morondo was surprised. Who are you? The giant said, I'm the powerful giant in this forest. I can grant your wish. Here, bring these cucumber seeds home and plant them, said the giant. He gave Morondo some cucumber seeds. What should I do with the cucumber then? Morondo still did not understand, like us. This would be a very special cucumber. Once you harvest, you will find a baby inside the cucumber, as you wish, promised the giant. Well, Mbokrondo was not 100% sure with the giant promise, but she would like to give it a try. She went home and she planted the seeds. As the time went by, the seeds grew into sprouts, leaves, flowers, and then the unusual part was finally coming. Now, Mo'rondo could find an enormous cucumber, golden cucumber, ready to be picked. She was very nervous and thinking that the giant might be right. Slowly, Mo'rondo cut the cucumber into half, and she did not believe what she saw. It was a baby inside the cucumber. It is a very charming and bright baby girl. Mo'rondo held her gratefully. The baby was named Timun Mas, or the Golden Cucumber. Timun Mas grew to be a devoted, kind, and brave young lady. Every day, she helped Mo'rondo in the rice field, and she was also very nice with the children in the village. Mo'rondo loved her very much, and they always took care of each other. Until one gloomy morning, the giant finally found Mo'rondo's house. He came and shouted, Mo'rondo, where is my cucumber? Mo'rondo was surprised to see the giant look very impatient. Your cucumber? Yes, my cucumber. Oh, I'm starving right now and nothing's left in my forest. I want to eat my big cucumber. And then Mo'rondo thought, Oh, giant, the cucumber is now my little girl. You know that, right? The giant thought for a while and he laughed. <laughs> That's even better. A girl must be bigger than a cucumber. I won't be starving anymore. Um, here, giant, let me tell you. You can meet my girl, but not today. She's very ill and small. Of course, you cannot eat the sick human, right? It would be very bitter. How about you come back here tomorrow? Mo'rondo bergained. The giant was a little bit disappointed, but he agreed and he came back to the forest. He did not know that actually Timun Mas was healthy and she was staying inside the house. That evening, Mo'rondo went to the village to see a wise man who can do magic. She told him what was happening and the wise man gave her three things. A sharp needle, salt, and shrimp paste or terasi in Indonesia. 
He said that Timon must should bring with them, with her if the giant chased her. And then the next day, the giant came back. Now he was very impatient and trying to find Timon Mas anywhere. Unlucky, he saw Timon Mas was running away from the house through the backyard door. Oh, I will catch you, cucumber! shouted the giant. He kept chasing Timon Mas, and Timon Mas did not stop running. She remembered to bring three things from the wise man. And first, she threw the needle to the giant behind her. Suddenly, the needle grew into a land of sharp bamboos, which blocked the giant's way. But the giant kept running, although the bamboos hurt him badly. Timon Mas was running and started to think what should, what should she throw now. Here your salt! Timon Mas threw some salt to the giant behind her. And the salt turned into a sea with huge waves. But the giant was very big. He tried to swim, although the water made his skin itchy. And he was still able to chase Timon Mas. But Timon Mas still believed that she could defeat the giant. So with, with a huge hope, she threw the shrimp paste or the terasi to the giant behind. And the paste turned into a sea of dirty mud and the giant could not even walk. Slowly, he was swollen by the mud and disappeared. Timun Mas was very grateful. She came back home and hugged Bok Rondo, thanking her. This tale resembles the myth among the elders in Javanese communities that some items can protect us from the unseen or the evil, such as scissors, pin, which can protect pregnant women from bad luck and evil until today. I think that's all. Thank you very much, and I hope you are entertained. Uh, we certainly were. Well done. Thank you so much, Zara. Uh, I love the way that you kind of switched between um, the <laughs> other characters and then into the, the giant with the voice and the whole way you physicalized that. Okay. Um, and yeah, what a, a, a fun story. And it uh, reminds me of a, a, a Japanese story. I sh I'm sure Oshima was kind of going, oh, yes, that's well, no, uh, possibly. I was thinking one of there's one called the three uh, magic charms, <coughs> uh, where again, we have three pieces of paper. Uh, and when the character is being chased by the uh, ogre, then the, this poor little boy uh, throws them over his shoulder and they change into um, uh, sea is one uh, and the uh, mud or sand is, is another. So very strong parallels there. Uh, I thought that was an excellent uh, debut and I hope we're going to see that's just the first uh, of many times and that you will come back and share uh, another story from Indonesia. We'd uh, love to hear that. I Thank you so. very Thank much you. indeed. Thank, Thank you. you, Roger. Very good. Uh, and speaking of someone who uh, comes back uh, many times, it's a, a pleasure to be reconnected with uh, Jim uh, Kassain. Hi, Jim. How are you doing? Roger, I am glad to be here with everybody today. And I'm okay. going to share with you a Native American Indian tale. Wonderful. <clears throat> Over to you. Go on. It was a beautiful, warm sunny summer morning and the handsome young bald eagle was soaring high in the sky lifted higher and higher by the warm blustery wind currents he had good reason to be proud of his plumage and beauty and he felt confident that as he flew overhead all eyes were looking up upon him and even the other birds in the sky gazed upon the young eagle with great awe and respect. In his mind, he told himself, without a doubt, in all of God's creation, I am the most admired bird of prey that has ever existed. He so enjoyed soaring high above the woods and ascending into the billowy white clouds above with his sharp eagle eyesight able to pick out his prey far below. Then, with lightning-fast stealth speed and laser-like accuracy, he would swoop down and capture his next meal, be it on land 
or water. But this routine, which he repeated day after day, leaving the ground and flying aloft, reaching higher and higher into the clouds, was becoming boring for the young eagle. And he began to wonder, is this all there is to life? One day, the young bird, instead of flying high above the clouds, decided this day he would fly low, staying closer to the treetops to see if the view might be any different. And as he flew in and out amongst the trees, he spied a little old man dressed in tattered black clothing, carrying a small bucket, strolling down a dirt path, meandering through the wood. And as the eaglet got closer, he heard a tune the old man singing in a deep, dark voice. Earthworms for sale, earthworms for sale. I've got big, fat, juicy ones and eensy, weensy, squeensy ones. See how they wriggle and worm. Earthworms for sale. Earthworms for sale. The young bald eagle thought, Oh, how I'd love to try earthworms. They sound like such a treat. You see, the restless eagle was tiring of its usual daily diet of small fish and reptiles and dead animals. And the thought of this new treat became irresistible to the young eaglet who thought, I wonder how much they are. Circling, slowly and carefully descending toward the man, he finally landed on the old man's shoulder where the young eagle cawed. How much do you want for your earthworms? Oh, they're cheap. The old man answered, just one feather for one earthworm. Oh, how I would love to try earthworms, the small eagle thought. No one would notice one little feather missing. I have so many. And the young eaglet plucked out one of his beautiful dark gray feathers and handed it to the old man in his beak in return for a delicious earthworm. Then the worm in his beak, he soared up into the clouds, happy and content. The young eagle could not have known that there was a huge illegal black market for eagle feathers, highly sought after by participants in Native American tribal dance competitions. The old man smiled as he made the exchange, knowing there would be a great deal of money awaiting him for this perfect eagle feather from an eager buyer. The eagle found the earthworm was indeed very tasty. And the following day, the bald eagle again soaring above the treetops, again heard the old man singing his song. Earthworms for sale, earthworms for sale. Oh. I'm beginning to love these earthworms, the young eaglet thought. The worm tasted so good yesterday, and no one even noticed I had a feather missing. Maybe I'll have just one more. So again, he descended, plucked a feather, and traded it for another earthworm. And the same scene was repeated the next day, and the next, and the next, until he plucked one feather too many. That day, after purchasing another earthworm, he found he could no longer soar into the sky. No matter how hard he flapped his wings, no matter how high he hopped, he couldn't catch the wind in his few remaining feathers. Dejected over what he had done, and with a broken spirit, he crawled into the tall grass beside the path, and deprived of his airborne existence, slowly died. The convocation of eagles 
noted the absence of the young eaglet and dispatched scouts to find their young member. An older bald eagle with the experienced hunter vision that comes with time, flying overhead, spied his little friend, swooped in with his huge sharp talons, picked him up and carried him far away across the lake to the traditional eagle burying grounds. There they buried the young eaglet under a giant oak tree, and with their sharp beaks and talons, they scratched into the bark of the tree the young eagle's epitaph. Here lies a poor little bald eagle. Hush your note, each bird that sings. Here lies a poor foolish bald eagle who for earthworms sold his wings. Thank you. Oh, I love that uh, ending, that couplet. Very nice, very nice. Yep. For a moment, I thought it was going to be a story about, you know, a poor quiet story about why he's called a bald eagle, because he'd kind of taken the feathers. But no, very nice, very nice. Thank you for sharing that one, Jim. Let us continue to spread our wings as we move on to uh, Shraddha. So I'm Shraddha here. Shada, okay. hi Shada. I do apologize. Okay, hi. I do How apologize. How lovely it is to see you all. Shada, really. Yes, okay. Uh, so where are you where are you um speaking to us from? I uh, I live in Bangalore. Ah, very good. Very good. Okay. Uh, and how are things there? W were you affected by the um, floods or power outages? No, no, no. Uh, uh, actually, the floods happened in Chennai. Just the only in Chennai. Okay. City, yes, the capital okay. city of Tamil Nadu. And there it was very, very bad. And, uh, mm. you know, I could see uh, Ambujavalli's uh, uh, posts on Facebook also. She had to stand on the terrace and she had a, I mean, all of them had a lot of difficult times, you know. Yeah, yeah, very dramatic. Yes, yes. And now, yeah. thankfully, it is getting better. Yeah. But then uh, they say that uh, I mean, a lot of, you know, a foul smell and uh, things are not really settled. Still. Mm. Sure, sure, sure. Well, listen, thank you very much for uh, joining us uh, this evening with a story. H have you told on a, 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 a feast story swap before? I, I, you know, though I wasn't able to, you know, uh, co connect with uh, Feast very regularly, but, you know, I always had you on mind. And I have done uh, a few stories earlier, yeah. but not as frequently as the others. No. Well, listen, it's great that you've managed to uh, reconnect and hopefully in 2024, you'll have more uh, time uh, to be with us. Definitely. So why don't you... Good. So... Uh, I'm looking, you seem to be in a, a, a very interesting uh, space there. I see a painting on an easel, uh, and I see, is that a Vena as well? Is this oh, your yes. studio? Yes, that, this is my storytelling space. And uh, that painting was actually done by my daughter. In fact, she hasn't completed the painting if you see the canvas. Mm. So she's just completed, uh, she's just started the painting. So I was actually telling her, Shreya, you ne I uh, need a creative painting wherein, you mm. know, I can, people can look at it and, uh, you know, I want to put it as a storytelling uh, Wonderful. canvas. Wonderful. Sure, like sure. Uh, well, so, hopefully next time uh, we come back, the painting will have advanced and it'll be, you know, a little bit fuller. Uh, and there'll be less and less absolutely white wonderful. space. Yes. So over, over to you. Tell okay. us your story. So thank you so much. Thank you so much. And I'm really excited to share the story with you. So uh, today, this is going to be a story from the uh, Indian Purana called the Ramayana. And uh, this is the story of Shakuntala that I would like to share. So Shakuntala, the sister of the powerful king Ravana of Lanka was very beautiful. She was born to the great Rishi Vaishrava and the Asura princess called Kaikesi. Before Vaishrava married Kaikesi, he had a wife, the first wife 
and they had a son called Kubera. So if you all would know, Kubera is considered as the god of wealth in India. So when Vaishrava married for the second time, uh, to uh, when he married this Asura princess called Kaikesi, Kaikesi was determined. She wanted to somehow make her own children the king or the rulers of Lanka. So, four children were born to her. Ravana, Vibhishana, Kumbhakarna and Shurpanaka. So, Shurpanaka was the youngest sister of the lot. Now, when, you know what, a mother is supposed to love the child dearly. The mother is the only person, isn't it? But when Shurpanaka was born, Kaikesi hated it. She never expected a daughter to be born. She wanted four sons so that she could throw out this ruler called Kubera from the kingdom of Lanka and uh, make her own children the rulers of Lanka. But the last child was Shurpanaka. And when she was born, she was never treated well by her mother. So right from the beginning, Shurpanaka and her mother did not share a good relationship. And it thus happened that this hatred also was transferred to her brothers, mainly Ravana. So if you see, Ravana and Shurpanaka never had a good cordial relationship as brother and sister from the beginning. Once when Shurpanaka came of age, she fell in love with an Asura called Vidyujiva. He belonged to a different clan of Asuras, namely the Dhanavas. Now what happened when Ravana came to know about this. When Ravana came to know that Shurpanaka had married Vidyajiva, she was he was furious. He never expected that his sister would marry his enemy. So he somehow wanted to end this relationship and kill Vidyajiva. But upon insistence from Mandodari, the wife of Ravana, that Shurpanaka and Vidyajiva must be encouraged to live as man and wife because they had already got married. Ravana had to agree to this. And slowly he started accepting Shurpanaka and Vidyajiva as husband and wife. So once Ravana went to visit Shurpanaka's home, Unfortunately, Vidya Jehva was alone at home and Shurpanaka was not there. So this, you know, you already know that they were enemies, right? And Vidya Jehva, one more thing, Vidya Jehva had married Shurpanaka only with the sole intention of taking revenge on Ravana. So when the both, uh, both of them met, you know, there was a tough battle between the two of them and they fought and fought and ultimately you all know that Ravana easily could, you know, overpower Vidyajiva and he killed him instantly in that fight. So when Shurpanaka came to know about this, this created a gigantic misunderstanding between the brother and the sister. And she was not ready to accept Ravana's side of the story. She was furious. She was panting. She was angry. She didn't know what to do. So in order to get some peace of mind, she started roaming the forests of Lanka and India. And it was during that time that she happened to see the exiled prince of Ayodhya, Sri Rama. So when she saw Rama, 
his handsome physical features and looks and you know beautiful appearance she was smitten by his love the love you know which um, she was she was so so mesmerized by his beauty so he without any he, uh, humiliation or shyness she rushed to rama and declared her love to him but rama refused then upon insistence she kept on troubling rama to marry him so when she did that rama directed her to go to lakshmana and when she went to lakshmana you know what happened lakshmana humiliated her and insulted her by chopping off her nose and ears and an insulted shurpanaka started backing away from the brothers she started running away when she saw the beautiful sita and when she saw sita then she knew why rama had refused her because she was so beautiful and that was when this thought struck her that she had an opportunity to defeat ravana by a creative plot and you know what she did she went running to ravana and cried to him telling him that rama had rama and lakshmana had humiliated her because i mean in the process of that she was trying to bring sita to ravana because she knew that ravana had a weakness for beautiful women so what happened when she completely narrated all that had happened adding up a lot of her own things you know to put ravana into her trap ravana had to fall into her trap he listened to everything that she said and he realized that shurpanaka had tried to bring sita to him and in the process of that she was insulted and humiliated and there she made sure that ravana abducted sita and there was no doubt that rama was going to let ravana off the hook he was going to take revenge on ravana and the perfect revenge happened so that is the end of the story but before ending the story you know being in uh, being from india i would uh, love to just sing a small line of this favorite song of mine ram mantra vajapi so राम मंत्र व जपी सो हे मानुजा राम मंत्र व जपी सो जय श्री राम थैंक यू thank you what a, a lovely way to end that uh, can you tell us just uh, what you were singing there what are the the lines why do yes. they resonate for you yes so this is a song by this great saint called purandara dasa from karnataka and he was an ardent devotee of shri rama and uh, he has composed numerous songs in praise of rama mm. the uh, great god of india and uh, this is one song with, uh, the meaning of the song the general meaning of the song is you know if you it's enough if you just utter the uh, uh, shri rama's name you know mm. rama's name and that will take you uh, to eternity something like that ah sure thank you thank you uh, it's fascinating that you should uh, tell the story of uh, supanaka uh, because when we were in jakarta um one of the highlights of our time there 
was a collaboration between uh, four of our members from India, uh, Ambuja and Lavanya and Parvati and Devjani, who collaborated with three uh, Indonesian performers. Uh, and they staged a uh, almost 90 minute uh, version of the Ramayana. Um, and told by wow. one character from each, uh, there were seven of them, the seven kandas uh, in the story. Uh, and um, Devjani took the character of um, Surapanika, and I'd never realized how important uh, she is in terms of being, um, if you like, the, the trigger who really kind of kicks the whole uh, story in, into action, this desire for revenge uh, upon uh, Rama and, and her brother too. Um, so it's fascinating to have this very different kind of um, perspective in the way that you've um, shared the story. Um, and for anybody, it, it's interesting. Um, the, this collaboration grew out of a uh, performance that was originally created for our Feast Fest back in 2021. Uh, it was seven half hour uh, episodes, oh. uh, one per night for a whole week, the first week of the festival. Um, and at this moment, as I speak, uh, Jeff Gear is working on his Jeff Picks 2, uh, and he's editing it down from three and a half hours to like uh, a 60-minute presentation, uh, wow. which it will be uh, hopefully sometime uh, fairly early in 2024, uh, will be um, available online uh, in collaboration with a company called Six Feet Apart, that are based Fabulous. in San Francisco. Fabulous. So, yeah, we're really excited about that. Um, it seems that, of course, I mean, the Ramayana story goes on and on and on, and we're just delighted to be playing a very small part in to kind of um, uh, keep that uh, going uh, and perhaps to make more people, particularly uh, on Jim's side of the world, at least uh, a little more aware of the story. So thanks very much indeed, uh, and I do apologise once again for <laughs> Thank you so much. You. Great, great, Thank great. Thank you so much. I enjoyed telling the story. Excellent. And do make sure your daughter carries on with the artwork. It looks as though it's going to be oh, yes. lovely. <laughs> <laughs> thank very you. good so thank you and uh, and now i'm very happy to be co connecting with uh joe uh, we keep uh crossing paths literally whether that's on a tail tour or um uh in turkey where we were on the lichian way together so good to see you uh and that's a very striking backdrop that you've got there uh, that's obviously not Jakarta. So where where are you now? Tell me what, where where's that? Actually, in Greece. Wow, of course, very good. So I would guess, and and judging by your attire too, that's not kind of bushwalk um, costume. So uh, I guess we're going to have a Greek story. Over to you, Joe. So insightful, so wise, so intuitive about <laughs> where stories can. But we, Raja, you we 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 are grateful to have. Over to you, go. Sigmund, king of Thessaly, had all that power could grasp, but he wanted more. Erythrichthon's palace, decided Erythrichthon, should not be down on the lowlands of Greece. No, he would build it high, in the highest point, closest to Olympus. The only thing that he needed was the labour of his people and to remove some odd trees there. Chop down the trees. But his men were strangely reluctant to obey him. Oh, Lord, those trees are the sacred grove of the goddess Demeter. In, in that grove there lives the, the dryad. Her dryad. <sighs> Chop down the trees. So they did. Sluggishly, unwilling, they submitted. And one at a time, they brought down the trees of the sacred grove of Demeter until there was just one tree remaining. And the last man laid down his axe. 
What fools I have to serve me. Come now, watch, and you can learn what courage can do. And at that, Erisichthon seized the axe and began to chop. Thunk, thunk, thunk. And that tree, that lone tree reaching to the heavens, shook and shuddered and And from that now dead tree spilt the now dead dryad. And the wind blew. And in that sound of the wind going through the crackling dead leaves of her tree was the voice of Demeter. You want more? More? I curse you now, Erisichthon, that you will never have all that you want. Your hunger will be deathless. And in the body of Erisichthon, the king, where normal, healthy, human hunger for food dwelt, that hunger grew teeth and claws and began to gnaw and claw at his innards. He needed food. He ate all the food that was on his plate. More. He ate all the food in the banqueting hall. More. All that was in the kitchen, in the cellar, all through the palace. More. 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 He ate all that was around. He took all that was, he ended up selling all his treasures, all his necessities, in order to buy food. He took the food from the mouths of his people, rich and poor, and still it was not enough. It could never be enough. And he took all that he needed for food, for food, but every bite he took, that hunger grew until he was left with, Nothing except his appetite. And his daughter, Mestra, she alone would stay by his side, near him as he trudged through the dusty paths of Thessaly, near him as he begged the king for food, near him as he reached out to steal food. Thief! Uh, you want to have my food, you better pay for it. Pay for it, but with a thought. I, I, have, I have no money. I, I have nothing. But the eyes of the baker have gone past the once king and were resting on Mestra. I wouldn't say that. My daughter? You want my daughter? The thought that someone would take his daughter, treasure of his heart, just in return for some bread. Bread. And he thrust the girl at, at the baker and took out the food. He did not look at her as she left. He was eating. And Mestra, Mestra dragged along by the man who was now her master, who would do anything, anything he wished. She turned to her father, but he could offer no hope. Where, where could she turn for someone, someone who would give her what she needed? Poseidon! Poseidon, do you remember the love that you once bore me when I swam in your warm oceans? and your waters caressed my naked body. If you remember, hear me, help me. And Poseidon heard. Poseidon remembered. And Poseidon came down and transformed her so that in the place of that beautiful young maiden was now an ugly old crone. And the baker, looking at his prize, did not see what he was after. <laughs> Useless for his aims, and so he cast her free, and she ran off back to her father. 
Parasika was delighted to see her. <laughs> now he could do it over and over again. He could sell his daughter to whoever would give him food and she would come trotting back as a, a cow or a pig or a goat. Everything that he needed to give him more food. But as he raised the food to his lips, he, he, he looked up and he, he saw her just looking at him, just looking at him. Oh, by all the gods in Olympus, what am I doing? That you, treasure of my heart, should be brought to this end. And he took her, her sweet hands in his and he kissed her fingers in a kiss of contrition to beg her mercy on him. And, and as he did, his tears fell down on her fingers and he brought her hand up close to his mouth so that he could smell how fragrant she was. And he could feel the warm, soft weight of her flesh in his hands. And he took her fingers closer, closer to taste once more. Mistra, oh, no, 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 Poseidon! And once more, Poseidon came down, swooping down from the heavens to scoop her up and take her away, away from all danger, leaving Erosikthon alone. Nothing. Nothing but that endless hunger in his body that, and he could feel it, his body just a, a case for all that hunger. And he could feel the old bones and he could feel the empty flesh. And he began to eat himself. Happy ending, Roger? Uh, yes, yes, definitely. Yeah. Hmm. yeah. It's a, it's a jolly little Christmas story I like to pull out at this time of year. Yes, yeah, yeah, you know, good, instead of like the fun pudding, you know, I just, it's just, it, the name itself is a mouthful, actually, of the man, yes. How do you spell that? I, I'm just trying to get my lips and my, you know, tongue around it, really. Yes, yes. Well, raise it to your mouth and you will taste. Yeah, indeed. Yeah. Very good. Very good. Yeah, yeah. Suitably dark and, and, and delicious uh, and, and perfect. The next time that somebody says, can I have an, you know, an extra uh, piece of turkey or something, I think you should just you know, pass that story on the I, plate. It's very I, love, I love gnaw and claw. I thought that was a great phrase. Thank you very much indeed for that. So, uh, if that was the the the, um, uh, the main the, uh, course, as it were, I think we do have uh, time. Uh, that, um, I'd like to hear uh, Ambu. Uh, you have a story for us, yes. which I hope is a little sweeter. Uh, the character whom I am going to talk about is definitely very sweet. The story. Well, wait. We have to wait till the end. Oh, certainly. Okay. Well. Uh, thank you uh, for taking the time to transform yourself for this. So please, um, over to you. Madhari Pingal, Madhi Nirai Nananalal, Madhari Pingal. If you had been here in South India yesterday, you would have heard the song from most of the temples. For the most auspicious month of the Hindu calendar, Margari started yesterday. Why is Margari so special? There are many, many reasons. Let me tell you only the one where I am related. By the way, who am I? I am popularly known as Andal, which means the one who ruled. Ruled over whom, what, when and how? That is the story I am going to share with you all. Many, many, many years back, Mahavishnu, the Hindu god of protection, he was very upset. 
He looked at his consort Shri Devi and she and he said, Ah, Shri Devi, in my incarnation as Krishna, I taught everything to everyone in the form of Gita. The do's and don'ts and what everybody has to do to attain salvation. But I am not sure if everyone understood that because I don't see anyone following that. What do I do? With a smile, Shri Devi replied, Oh dear, there is a difference when a father teaches a child and when a mother teaches a child. You know which one is better. Well, Shri Devi, in that case, why don't you go down, take a human form and teach everything that I have already taught? No, whenever I give a solution, you ask me to execute it. That's not possible. Being Sita with you, Rama, I have had enough. I can't go now. And that's when Bhu Devi or Bhumi Devi, the Mother Earth, Mahavishnu's another consort, she came forward and she said, Dear Lord, if you remember, I volunteered to do the same many, many years back. Allow me to go help my children. So be it, said Mahavishnu. And Bhumi Devi or Bhu Devi was born as a child. Shri Manarayana, Shri Manarayana, Shri Manarayana, Shri Manarayana, Shri Manarayana, Shri Padamecharanu. In the temple town of Shri Puttur in South India, there lived a priest by name Vishnu Chittar. Every day, he would tie a garland from the flowers from his garden and he would offer the garland to the Lord who resided in the temple there. Devotion to the Lord was his way of life. One day, he found a small girl child in his garden near the Tulsi or the basil plant. He named her Kodai and brought her up with so much of love and affection. Let me cut the suspense. I was that child. I was named Kodai. Right from the moment, I was taken by him. I grew up listening to stories of Krishna and I loved him so much. And you know why. When I was a young girl, my father, he had tied a garland and he had kept it there and he had gone somewhere. And that garland was so tempting. I took the garland. I wore it. I looked at my reflection in the well. How I looked, you know. I was sure this garland will add beauty to my dear Krishna. I removed the garland, placed it back and I went off. That evening, you know what my father said? Godai, you know what? The Lord was glowing today. I didn't tell him the secret. From the next day, this secret routine became my favorite. Every day, my father would tie the garland. I will wear it and then look at my reflection, remove it back, keep it. Days passed by and the Lord started glowing. My father didn't know why. Until one day, I was careless. While removing the garland, one strand of hair got stuck into it. I didn't notice. But my father noticed it when offering to the Lord. And he was upset. Things supposed to be offered, offered to the Lord should be prepared with utmost devotion. He discarded the garland, returned back, tied another garland. He kept it and he went inside. I was tempted again. I took the garland, I wore it and before I could put it back, I got caught. My father saw me and he was angry. He was so furious. He yelled at me. Kodai, how can you do this? He discarded that garland too. He prepared another garland. He went and he offered it to the Lord. But the Lord wouldn't take it. My father was very upset. He thought it was because of me the Lord was angry on us. How could I explain it to him? That night, the Lord appeared in my father's dream and he said, Dear Vishnu Chitta, the garland owned by Kodai has her pure love and devotion. Going forward, offer only those garlands which have already been owned by her. I will not accept anything else. Well, those were the days when we believed in our dreams. 
my father you know things changed my secret routine was not a secret anymore my father would ask me every day ko they wear this garland only then the lord would accept let me tell you something it was this is not something that happened then even today till date in shrivalliputtur in that temple the garland is first offered to me and only then it is given to the lord well days passed by and my father wanted to get me married and that's when i told him appa kannan daanyan kanavan kannan daanyan kanavan vennai undavan ennai maayakki vennai undavan ennai maayakki sindhayil ellam thannai nirappi you know what he did thannai endri verethum illai endru unara cheyda kannan daanyan kanavan the lord is my husband and my father couldn't trust what i was telling oh kodai can't you understand you are a human being how can you get married to the lord i didn't want to explain and that's when the auspicious month margari started and i started my fasting fasting not the ones which you all do now it had different rules sometime later i will explain that to you every morning along with my friends i will go pray my pray to my lord i composed one song every day on my lord 30 songs which came to be called as tirupavai a big story behind all these 30 songs for some time later well margari got over and the lord appeared in my father's dream again and he said vishnu chitta it's time that i get married to kodai bring her to shri rangam and there i will marry her as i told you those were the days we believed in our dreams the king trusted my father and he made all the arrangements for my wedding dressed in the most beautiful bridal clothes i was carried in a palanquin like a princess with such a huge procession elephants horses gifts what not malai satri naal kodai malai matri naal malai satri naal kodai malai matri naal malayodu madilarangan malai avatan maarbile malai satri naal kodai malai matri naal the moment i reached shri rangam something took over me i couldn't wait any more i jumped off the palanquin rushed inside the sanctum sanctorum and there i saw my lord in the reclined position top to toe the moment i was waiting for and the next second everything went blank i marched with him invisible nobody could see me and after a second om namo narayanaya people started calling out my lord's name but there was my father with tears flowing from his eyes i couldn't see the wedding of my own daughter and i felt so bad i didn't i didn't even bid a proper goodbye to him i looked at my lord and he said don't worry let's meet him in a bridal costume and both of us appeared in front of my father in proper bridal wear and we touched his feet asking for his blessings my father was startled oh no the lord and my daughter the mother of the universe no you shouldn't be touching my feet my lord smiled and he replied no she is your daughter always and because i married your daughter you are my father in law and it's my duty to ask for the blessings and it's your right to bless me please bless us and i came to be called as andar because i started ruling over the lord well i came down for a purpose of course getting married to him again was one but there was another purpose and how did i do that the 30 songs the tirupavai which i composed came to be called as the seed of the vedas the ancient scriptures of the hindu religion which is supposed to contain everything the do's and don'ts the way of living everything to attain salvation but it's very difficult to master that i tried to give it in a very simple way for human beings to understand and i hope it reached them 
and why am i sharing my story with you all today i want to help from all of you there is this woman no she really gets angry when i call her a woman this girl who loves me so much we share a special bond from her childhood she always says that she wants to meet me at least once but silly girl she is she doesn't understand she doesn't have to look for me anywhere else because i reside within her and if you get to meet that girl please share this with her will you anandam anandam anandame anandam anandam anandame aandalin kadai taan ketome anandam anandam anandame Thank you. That was lovely, Ambu. Thank you. I love the line. Uh, uh, those are the days when we, um, what was it? Listen to our dreams. Yeah. Very nice. Very nice. Uh, and and so yesterday, is that why you chose to to tell this story? Uh, uh, yes, Roger. As I told, like um, this is one character which is like uh, very very close to my heart. If I start mm. talking about Andal and things, I mean related to her, like you know, uh, my friends here know. Like I have been working. bring them with all the details so um af- actually i had another story in my mind sheila knows before i mean and once i got to know uh, i mean i'm going to back up tell her i thought the time may not be enough for that but i'm sure this also went long and uh, yesterday being margery just struck okay mm. this is a story uh, that Wonderful. has to be shared and uh, also jim uh, jim also posted recently uh, um about the snakes and ladders in uh, facebook um the game which we play Hmm. so uh, so uh, that was also another uh, uh, trigger to this because there is uh, as i told you there are many specialities of this month one of those is called vaigunda ekadashi the overnight we will not sleep we'll keep playing that game and hmm. the game is supposed to tell us the do's and don'ts you now we all have played that game right snakes hmm. and what takes you high and what brings you down hmm. so the whole night we play that game to make us i mean it's telling us See, these are the right things you have to do. These are the things you have to stop. Mm. So that was also another trigger. I mean, Andal is mm. not related to that, but still. Yeah, wonderful. Well, uh, thank you uh, for taking us up. I think the stories, uh, all the stories uh, that we've heard uh, today, have really been uh, like the, um, uh, as you mentioned, Jim there with his uh, eagle uh, and taking us up uh, to different places. So. Um thank you everybody very much for um coming and making this swap as they so often are just so uh, unpredictable and full of riches. Um if I could just uh finish we have um uh this is really I think wow uh, the end of a really uh, exciting year for us in feast but we certainly have um uh, lots to look forward to uh in the new year. uh we have um three events coming up in um january uh, the first uh is just tell uh if you're not familiar for that it's a bit like a story swap except that you don't have to register you just come along and just tell uh and it's much more in, even more informal uh than is than than this evening uh and we tend to have a lot more chat uh in between the stories uh and uh, if you want to have feedback people will give you a uh, feedback and we've pledged that if anybody uh, who comes wants to tell they will get to tell um we haven't had to go into breakout rooms because normally we only have like three or four people at any one particular time who want to tell but as i say come along azara it would be a perfect place for you to come uh, and join us and to tell another story because it can be a work in progress something that you are still filling your way through the story we've had that from uh, quite a number of people over the past few months when we've had that so uh, that's on the 10th so thank you once again can we give uh, all the people who've told a big round of applause thank you so much uh, we'll try and get this edited a couple of people were asking will i get the link uh, you most certainly will uh, and we'll put it up uh, on our website where we have all or almost all of our previous uh, story swaps so if you've enjoyed that and you haven't had a chance to look at those you're welcome just go on to the website and you'll see um we have a story swap page there